Over the past few lectures, we've been looking at ways that X-rays can scatter constructively off of crystals, a condition which we call diffraction. And we've seen two different ways we can think about it. We first encountered the more familiar Bragg's Law, in which we considered a geometry where the X-rays reflect off of planes in the crystal. And then we looked at the Lowy equations, where we saw that the X-rays go through the crystal and they are deflected at certain directions to give constructive interference. And those directions are given by the Lowy equations and the patterns of constructive interference we see are related to the reciprocal space lattice. In this lecture, we're going to see how these two seemingly different ways of thinking about diffraction are actually consistent with each other. Let's start with a concept from solid-state chemistry, and that is the idea of a plane in a crystal, and the direction of that plane is given by the Miller indices. So for anyone who's taken solid-state chemistry, this would be a familiar concept for you, but let me just go through it here. If we take a plane that's signified by this blue triangle, it's actually an infinite plane, but what we see here is just the part of the plane that's within the unit cell. And then we look at where that plane intercepts the lattice vectors. It intersects the A lattice vector at one half of A. It intersects the B lattice vector at one quarter of B. And it intersects the C lattice vector at one. If we now take the reciprocals of those fractional intercepts with the unit cell vectors, uh, we come up with the Miller indices. So the reciprocal of one half is two, the reciprocal of one quarter is four, and the reciprocal of one is just one. So this is a two, four, one plane. And we put these numbers, which are H, K, and L, inside uh, parentheses. I should point out that sometimes we have planes that are parallel to one or more of the lattice vectors, in which case they don't have an intercept. Here we see the 2, 2, 0 plane, right, which has an intercept of one half with A and one half with B. And because it's parallel to the C lattice vector, it doesn't have an intercept with C. We would say its intercept is infinity, and the reciprocal of infinity is 0. That's how we get the 220 Miller indices for this plane. Now, how can we define a plane in terms of vectors? So one way that you can define a plane in terms of vectors would be to specify two vectors that are contained within the plane. We could do that here. For example, if we look at the bottom edge of the triangle, Right, that's a vector that's contained entirely within the plane. And the coordinates of this vector can be obtained by just taking this point, one half A, minus this point, one quarter B. Okay. We could write it in a general form that would be for any intercept with the A and B axis. And for this particular vector P, its value is A over 2 minus B over 4. We could also write the coordinates for the vector that defines this edge of the triangle, Q, uh, and that's going to be this point, C, minus the beginning point here, A over 2. Two vectors is sufficient to specify the orientation of a plane, but just for completeness, let's do the third side of this triangle and call that vector R. Its value would be B over 4 minus C. An even simpler way to specify the orientation of a plane would be to define the coordinates of the vector that is perpendicular or normal to that plane. I'm going to suggest that we might consider the reciprocal space lattice vector whose coefficients are the HKL Miller indices. So in this case, what if we look at a vector that is twice times the A star vector plus 4 times the B star vector, plus the C star vector. Right, if you are a little bit unsure what I mean by reciprocal space lattice vectors, please see the previous lecture. Now let's look at the 
orientation of this vector with respect to the P, Q, and R vectors that we defined. All right, let's start with vector P. And let's take the dot product of our reciprocal space lattice vector G with that of P. Right, these are the coordinates of vector P. These are the coordinates of the vector G. Because it's a dot product, uh, we can do it in either order. And remember that the dot product of A star times A is just 1. And the dot product of A star times either B or C would be 0. Because A star must be perpendicular to B and C. So that means when we do the dot product, we just get 2 over 2 times the dot product of A times A star minus 4 over 4 times the dot product of B and B star. Well, these two dot products just go to 1, and of course the fractions go to 1, so we have 1 minus 1, which is equal to 0. Well, two vectors whose dot product is 0 must be perpendicular. And not only in this special case would this be true, but you can see that you know the coefficient in front of A is 1 over H. And the coefficient in front of A star is H. So whenever we do this, no matter what the values of H, K, and L are, we're going to come up with 0. We can do this for the other two vectors. We could take the dot product of our reciprocal lattice vector with the vector Q. And when we do that, we're going to get a very similar result. And once again, each term reduces to 1. And this minus sign, which comes from the Q vector, makes it 0. So the dot product here being 0 means that our reciprocal space lattice vector G is perpendicular to Q. And I think you can see the pattern emerging. If we were to do the same thing for vector R, we would get, once again, 0, indicating that this reciprocal space lattice vector G is perpendicular to R. So the upshot of all of this is that the reciprocal lattice vector H times A star plus K times B star plus L times C star is the vector that is perpendicular to the HKL plane. So the direction of this reciprocal space vector defines the orientation of the real space lattice plane HKL. And this is true for any crystal system and for any combination of HKL. So I've done this example with an orthorhombic crystal system, but if I were to do this in a triclinic crystal system, it would also be true. Now, what does that have to do with diffraction? What does that have to do with Bragg's law? You know, these planes of atoms that are scattering uh, the incoming X-rays, you know, those planes of atoms, we're going to take those to be the lattice planes, HKL. And so if we rewrite this where we make it not just D, but DHKL, so that's the distance between two specific planes in a crystal lattice, and we also drop out the N in front of lambda, so we're just going to say that the path length difference is 1 lambda. We'll come back at the end of the lecture and talk about the significance of that. So this is the picture that describes the conditions which give rise to constructive interference when we are reflecting x-rays off of a series of lattice planes. What does this have to do with Lowy's equations? First of all, notice that S minus S naught is a vector that is always going to be normal to these lattice planes. Right? So the vector S minus S naught, which is the direction along which we might say the beam is deflected is a vector normal to the lattice planes. We also know from Lowy's equations that S minus S naught for constructive interference to occur must be equal to this reciprocal space vector times the wavelength. But this reciprocal space vector, we just have derived the fact that it is perpendicular to the lattice planes HKL. So the connections now between Bragg's law and Lowy's equations start to become clear. Now, the key question is, what are the spacings between different crystal planes in a lattice? In other words, 
if we were to measure the theta values where we see constructive interference, we want to use those to calculate this DHKL. Or, alternatively, if we know the crystal structure, we know the DHKL values, we might want to calculate the values of theta where constructive interference occurs. So how can we relate this DHKL to our reciprocal space lattice vector? If we take S minus S naught, we get this triangle. And if we divide the triangle in two, then we have two right triangles. And in each of those, theta would be the angle up in this corner. And so this distance, S minus S naught, is going to be equal to two times the sine of theta. Uh, the hypotenuse here is one because these are unit vectors. Now if we look at Bragg's law, lambda equals two d sine theta. Let's take our first expression and replace two sine theta with s minus s naught. When we do that, we get this expression. And now Manipulating a little bit, let's divide both sides by lambda times d. And when we do that, we get 1 over dhkl equals s minus s naught divided by lambda. Here we're looking really just at the length of the vector, s minus s naught. We can plug in from Lowy's equation, now our reciprocal space lattice vector, h times a star plus k times b star plus l times c star times lambda, that's got to be equal to s minus s naught in order for constructive interference to occur. The lambdas cancel, as you see here, and then we come up with this very useful relationship. And what this relationship tells us is that the inverse of the inner planar spacing, dhkl, is equal to the length of the reciprocal space lattice vector, which is normal to the HKL planes. All right, so now we can calculate the distance between planes from our reciprocal space lattice vector. Now, can we express that distance between planes in terms of the real space lattice vectors? Obviously, we can, because the reciprocal space lattice vectors are defined in terms of the real space lattice vectors. Let's see what that would look like. So this is the equation that we took from the previous slide. And the length of a vector is just the square root of the dot product of that vector and itself. So we're going to say square root of the reciprocal space lattice vector dotted with itself. Now, in general, the reciprocal space lattice vectors are not necessarily orthogonal to one another, so this expression can get kind of complicated. But if we were to limit ourselves to crystal systems where the vectors are orthogonal to one another, that's the cubic, tetragonal, and orthorhombic systems, then it simplifies because A star dotted with either B star or C star is zero, and we see we only get a non-zero product when the two reciprocal space lattice vectors are the same. And in that case, we would get h squared times the length of a star squared, k star times the length of b star squared, and l star times the length of c star squared. But for an orthogonal crystal system, the length of a star is just 1 over a. The length of b star is just 1 over b. So we can rewrite it now with the real space lattice vectors. And then if we wanted to get rid of the square root term, we could square both sides. This is an equation we can use to calculate the distance between any set of HKL planes in terms of the Miller indices, H, K, and L, and the real space lattice constants of the crystal lattice. The form we've derived here would be a general form that we could use for cubic, tetragonal, or orthorhombic crystal systems. We can simplify this a little bit for the cubic and tetragonal systems. Right, so if we look at the orthorhombic system, just rewriting the equation here, if A and B are equal to one another, as they are in a tetragonal crystal, then we can combine these first two terms. They have the same denominator, and we get this expression. 
if A, B, and C are all equal to one another, as they are in a cubic crystal, then all three terms have the same denominator, and the expression reduces to this. I've also given the expressions DHKL for the hexagonal and monoclinic systems, where we have angles that are not necessarily all 90. And those expressions are, I would say, manageable. You can also derive expressions for a rhombohedral or a triclinic lattice. Those ones are pretty long, and it's kind of unlikely you're ever really going to do those by hand. But if you want to find those, you can look them up online. They're easily found. Now, let's just finish by talking about sets of lattice planes that are parallel to one another, but yet have different values of HKL. How can we think about the spacing of those lattice planes? So here I show, in a cubic crystal, the 110 lattice planes. So we're looking down the C direction, and we can see that the intercepts with A and B are 1. And of course, these planes are parallel to C. And you might remember from solid-state chemistry that a series of parallel planes, the distance between them is going to be the distance from the origin to this first plane. We're going to repeat that for all the others. Okay, so this is our set of 110 lattice planes. This value here is the spacing between those planes, D110. Now, the reciprocal space lattice vector that is perpendicular to these planes would be just a star plus B star, right? H is 1 and K is 1 and L is 0. I, I draw the lattice vector here. I should say that the length of this lattice vector depends on the value of A and B. Here I've drawn it for a lattice where the real space vectors A, B, and C are all 1. If those vectors were longer, reciprocal space vector would be shorter, but it would still have the same direction and it would still be perpendicular to these lattice planes. We can use the formula that we just derived to calculate the spacing between these lattice planes, D110. So plugging in 1 for H, 1 for K, and 0 for L, we come up with this. And rearranging to solve for the interplanar spacing, we get D110 is equal to the lattice constant A divided by square root of 2. That's the distance from here to here. What would happen if we now were to look at this set of lattice planes? This would be the 220 set of lattice planes. Here we see the intercepts now with A and B are both a half. And we can visually see that the spacing between the planes has now been cut in half. The reciprocal space lattice vector that's normal to these planes is, by definition, 2 times A star plus 2 times B star. Um, once again, its exact length would depend on the length of A, B, and C. But what's for sure is that this lattice vector is going to be twice as long as the reciprocal space vector G in the 110 case. And so if we were to calculate the interplanar spacing, uh, now we have 2 squared plus 2 squared plus 0 squared for our numerator. That's 8 over A squared. And the D220 now becomes equal to A divided by 2 square root of 2. And so we see that the spacing between the 220 planes is one half that of the 110 planes. Now when we come back to Bragg's law, remember we dropped this N. We had N lambda equals 2D sine theta, and we dropped the N. We said we're just going to make N equal to 1. Now we can see the implication of that. If you had let's say the 220 set of lattice planes, and you wanted to calculate Bragg's law for n equal to 2, that means on the other side of the equation we would have to double the distance, dhkl. But doubling the distance would just give us the spacing of the 110 planes. Okay, now that we are all set with being able to calculate these dhkl, we're really in a position where we can start to analyze diffraction patterns, and we'll do that in the next lecture.